Well, good morning. Good morning, good morning. How many of you are thankful for the hot day it's going to be? Yeah! Okay. So open your Bibles if you have one. If you need a Bible, we've got Bibles. Maybe you've got it on your phone, you know, and turn your phone on or turn the Bible app on to James chapter 4. We're going to look at verses just 11 and 12. We're making our way through the Bible, uh, th through the book of James, not, uh, not necessarily through the whole Bible, you know, in, in sequence. But James now, we're in James, everyday faith. So J uh, James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. So open that up. And uh, if you need message notes, uh, if you'd like message notes, there are, it might help you follow along with where we're going this morning. So if you need message notes, you came in without them, raise your hand. We've got people ready to Stick them in your hand. Anybody need message notes? All right. So here we go. Um, we're going to read the passage. By the way, I'm Pastor Scott. If you're new to Gold Coast, glad you're here again. And we're going to read the two verses, pray, and then just jump in. It's so practical, this, this, this passage. Here's what it says. The book of James, chapter 4, 11 and 12. Do not speak evil against one another. Brothers, the one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against or speaks evil against the law and judges the law but if you judge the law you are not a doer of the law but a judge there is only one lawgiver and judge who he who is able to save and to destroy but who are you to judge your neighbor father that's a great question did you ask us to to think about and find an answer for in this passage. Thank you for the book of James, Lord. Help us to hear, help us to understand, help us to be convicted by and surrender to the truths we're going to look at in these two short verses of Scripture today. It's so practical. We need your help in this area that we're going to jump into this morning. So again, guide us, teach us, help us to follow you and be doers of the word today and not just mere hearers. We pray it all for your glory and our good, in Jesus' name, amen. And so, uh, we're going to start with a, a short poll I, I came across recently. It's just three-question poll. We want to see your hands go up. And here are the three questions. The first question is, is it acceptable to arrive at a movie after the previews have already begun? Well, this is a show of hands, folks. That's a, okay. <laughs> yeah. Raise your hand. Let's look at, look around. Look around. So some of you, some of you, you know, I I I'd say yes personally. If you if you care to know what I think, <laughs> not that you necessarily would. I went to a movie this week, and it was like 25, 30 minutes of previews. So okay, acceptable. Okay, now, next question: Is it acceptable to put pineapple on a pizza? We need to pray for these people. <laughs> I have never degraded a pizza in my life by eating pineapple on it. Okay, that's a, I know, we, we can love each other, right? We can disagree. Okay. How about this one? Is it, accept, last one, here it is. Is it acceptable to accelerate through an intersection when you see the yellow in the traffic light? <laughs> Raise your hand. Some of you are going like that. Okay, here's a definition of acceptable. We use the word acceptable, okay? So write this definition down, or at least listen for it, because the, the word acceptable, mean, acceptable means something that's considered by most people to be reasonable or something that can be allowed, all right? Now, you say, why are we talking about this as we get into James chapter 4, verse 11? Well, James is addressing all kinds of sins we've already seen already in our study, right, that have become acceptable in our culture. But God calls them what? Sin. So you might even say, well, there's some acceptable sins. God says there's no acceptable sin. And we're going to look at one of these uh, acceptable sins by culture, by maybe some of us, that we put in the category of, oh, that's okay to do occasionally. And God's going, no, because... It's very clear what God says here. How he starts off, he says the first two words in James, chapter 4, verse 11. Read them out loud with me out loud. 
do not. Circle that. It's one word in the Greek. And in the Greek, when they would write, they'd put the, the emphasis, uh, the, the thing they want to emphasize, at the, the first word at the beginning of the sentence. So sometimes the, the word order wasn't that important as much as what you wanted to emphasize. And so he is emphasizing, do not ever, ever, what? Speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters in the church. Think about that. That, yeah, speak against, against, or that's the word sometimes, oftentimes is translated slander. Do not slander each other in the church. So what's that mean? What speak evil against one another means? It, it, one word in the Greek, and it's often translated slander. It means this, write this down. To speak degradingly, to speak degradingly about someone. To attack the good name and reputation of someone. To slander them. It's any speech that is harmful, write that word down, harmful, speech that is harmful towards another person, whether it's true or not. Whether it's true or false, God says this in Psalm 101, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. Wow. (laughs) No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure, says the Lord. Those are pretty harsh words, wouldn't you agree? And again, he's not talking about someone who's committing physical murder or who's falling down in front of an idol, although we could argue from the New Testament that when we speak against a brother or a sister, we slander someone, we cause them harm, we're we're committing relational harm against them, maybe even relational murder. And so this is a big deal. These two verses is a really big deal. He's talking about someone who is speaking against a brother or sister. And you say, well, listen, Scott, I'm an American. And as American, I have freedom of speech. Hey, how many of you as Americans are thankful that we are supposed to have freedom of speech? Okay. That's debatable these days. But, but you say, oh, hey, I, I'm, I'm not going to give up freedom of speech. Listen, as a Christian... Yes, as an American, freedom of speech. As a Christian, no, you don't have the freedom of speech. I mean, even as Americans, you don't have the freedom to yell fire in a crowded theater when there's no fire, right? But as a Christian, we are now under the authority of Jesus, right? He's our leader. He's our master. He is our um, authority. And therefore, we don't have freedom to speak any which way we want to. You say, well, it's true, but is, is it helpful or is it harmful? That's what James is getting at here in our text. Notice again, the, uh, it's, it's the, um, the phrase, don't slander who? One another. Write that down. One another. How many times is that phrase, we have translated one another, it's one word in the Greek, Over, around 40 times in the New Testament, the New Testament writers use that phrase, or that word it means one another. Love one another, forgive one another, bury one another's burdens, all that. And here it's saying, do not speak what? Evil, don't slander who? One another. Look around you. The, we, are the one, we are the one another's, right? We're not to do that. How does that look? How does that come about in our lives today? Here's some examples of speaking evil. Falsely damaging someone's reputation. Bringing incorrect accusations against somebody. Divulging private failures and weaknesses. Publicly exaggerating somebody's faults. Questioning or passing judgment on somebody's motives or intentions. And I'm telling you, in our culture, we're encouraged to do that every single day. And again, that one another there. It relates to, write this down, that word one another means another of the same kind. We are brothers and sisters of the same father. We're in the same family as we're going to see. So all slander has a common purpose, to use words to, in order to harm a person instead of help the person. And this is why James calls it speaking evil against one another. Now, here, write this down, Ephesians 4.29. It's what Paul says about the same issue. Paul teaches the very same thing in Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Now, that word corrupting is very interesting It's the word that means rotten, like a stinky fish. 
Don't let fish mouth be a part of your life. That's what it basically says, rotten talk. Don't let rottenness come out of your mouth. But only, he goes on to say, only such talk as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Our speech, when we talk about someone or talk to someone, it's to be seasoned with what? Grace. That means it's, it's to be a gift for that person. In other words, Paul is saying here that when we speak about somebody, it should be a gift of grace because it builds them up and it demonstrates the grace of God for them and in their lives. The grace of God for them and it's evidence in their life. So James says, don't speak evil against one another. Now, here's, here's where we're going to turn a, a slight corner here. Read on in the text. Because James here ties this to something else, this slandering. The one who speaks against a brother, he goes on to say, or what? Judges. So those two thoughts are tied together as far as God goes, as far as James is teaching. The one who speaks against a brother or judges, they're relative to one another. They're cousins, right? They're tied to each other. In other words, in speaking of slander, James exposes the roots of a judgmental spirit. You see, when we speak evil against a brother or sister in Christ, it reveals that we've already judged them. Oh, my. We've already judged them where? In the court of our heart. You see, we're simply now saying what's inside us. We're exposing what's already at at home in our hearts. And so, why do we judge others? Why do we have this propensity or this tendency to judge other people. I thought it'd be interesting to look at just some of the reasons. Just the ones that come to my mind. One, besides it's really fun. You can write that down. That's for free. That's not no blank. But I mean, I mean, let's be honest. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Pointing our fingers at others and versus pointing them at ourselves. So besides that, on your outline, write this down. First, we do it to excuse our own faults, to excuse ourselves from our own shortcomings. Because when we are pointing out the faults of others, we're putting the focus on who? Them and not us. The spotlight is now not going to be shining on us. We can shine it on other people. And if we think, we think it will make us look better. And so how we do that is we relabel our own faults. And what we say is for us, when we find ourselves gossiping, we don't call it gossip. We say we're just sharing a concern. Or when we're lazy, it becomes, hey, we're just kind of laid back and mellow. Or we, we, we call our negativity just being realistic. Or I'm not critical, I'm just a discerning person. But let's think about it this way. If I owed someone $10 million and you owed them $100 million, does that lessen my $10 million debt to them? No. And yet that's exactly what we do when we think we can point at others and judge them and say, look how bad they are. As if that makes us better before God than we really are. Because God doesn't grade on, grade on what? He doesn't grade on a curve. His standard is perfection. And uh, so going hand in hand with excusing ourselves is the next one on your outline. Write this down. We judge others to feel better about ourselves. Right? We elevate our own personal worth by lowering theirs. Whenever we see a person who's always criticizing, by the way, always judging, always putting people down, you can know one thing for sure. They don't feel very good about themselves. They have a low sense of self, and they're insecure. They try to build themselves up by putting other people down. And it's been pointed out over the years, that's why people read gossip magazines. And why people tune into shows like TMZ, right? So many times people want to look at the failures of people they can look to and go, look at them. I would never do that. Look at them. I would never do that. I feel so much better about myself, right? John Burke writes this. I watch the news and condemn those idiotic people who do such things. Most reality TV shows are full of people I can judge as sinful, ignorant, stupid, arrogant, or childish. 
I get in my car and I drive and I and I drive and I find a host of inept drivers who should have flunked their driving test. And I throw in a little condemnation on our Department of Public Safety for good measure. At the store, I complain to myself about the lack of organization that makes it impossible to find what I'm looking for, all the while being tortured with Muzak. Who picks that music anyway? I stand in the shortest line, which I judge is way too long because, look, people, it says 10 items or less, and I count more than that in your three baskets. (laughs) What's wrong with you people? And why can't that teenage checker, what is she wearing? Focus on work and to get us out of here. Judging makes us feel good about ourselves because it puts us in a better light than others. So consider now, according to James, look at the text, why we're not to judge others. He talks about this uh, in verse 11. We've already mentioned it. Brothers and sisters, we are brothers and sisters. That means we're part of the same family. Number one, we are part of the same family. See, in followers of Jesus, we're not to badmouth others, especially those who belong to the family and the household of God. But just four verses earlier, look in your Bibles to verse 7. Go back up in the text a few verses. Look at verse 7. James says, resist who? You see that? You know the word devil there? There's different names for Satan in the Bible. That is the word diablos, diablos, which literally is slanderer. Now, stop and think about this. He's saying, just a few verses later, you don't slander. He just called who the slanderer in verse 7. The devil is the slanderer. You're not a part of his family, are you? You're part of God's family. God's family, family honors each other. God's family speaks well of each other and encourages each other. And when there needs to be some, uh, some you know, uh, correction, they do it in love. They don't slander and tear down. It's just amazing to me. In fact, in um, Revelation chapter 12, the devil is called the accuser of who? The brethren, the brothers and sisters in God. That's Satan's job, to tear down. We're not part of his family. When we badmouth people and tear people down with our tongues, you know what? We resemble more being a family, part of the family of Satan than we do the family of God. Judging others, secondly, breaks the law. Or I don't know if it's second, next one. It breaks the law. Verse 11. Do you see what he says there? Uh, The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against what? I can't hear you with all the air conditioning. Yeah, I like it. Speak out loud. Yeah, good. The law. And judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of the law. Now, what law is he talking about? He's not talking about some civil code. He's talking about the royal law that we read about and learned about up in, back in chapter 2, verse 8. Take your Bibles, flip back to, or scroll to chapter 2 of James, verse 8. Remember what he's talking about, the royal law? What is the royal law? Look at verse, uh, verse 8 of chapter 2. It's love your neighbor as you love Who? Yourself, okay. So love your neighbor as you love yourself. Talk about your neighbor as you would want them to talk about you. God has judged this person and found this person innocent that you're slandering through the blood of Jesus, all right? If they're a part of your family, if they're a part of Christ's family, God has rendered them just before his eyes because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, but we come along and we go, oh, that's not, that judgment isn't good enough. I'm going to judge them by my law and my standard. And in this area, they fail and they don't live up to my standard. And so I'm going to slander them. I'm going to speak badly about them. Write this down. You can't love someone when you're defaming them, right? You cannot be loving and at the same moment trying to defame them. So we're part of the same family. We're breaking the royal law when we, we judge and we slander. Thirdly, it's not our job. It's not our job. Verse 12 tells us this. How many lawgivers and judges are there, according to verse 12? One. And guess what? What? He or she, he is not you. You're not him. 
There's one lawgiver and judge. In fact, that's an interesting phrase. It only appears seven times in the entire Bible, six times in the Old Testament, one time in the New, right here in James. And each, each time it happens, each occurrence, it's, talk, it's talking about God, not a man, not a woman, not a person. There's only, it's consistent through Scripture, one lawgiver and judge, God. And guess what? That role of God, that position has already been filled. And I, I remember a, t- a t-shirt, I, I wish I got it. I probably could have one made now these days. It said, I know two things. One, there's a God. Two, you're not him. I'm not him. Right? And for us to judge is above our pay scale. That's something only God can do. Righteously and perfectly. Um, Vadi Bakum, a pastor, author, speaker, it's interesting. You know how often we say, make Jesus your Lord, make Jesus your Lord, which is in one way true, true. but he brought out a point, and he said, you know, no one makes Jesus their Lord. You, he is Lord. All you can do is acknowledge him as Lord because he's the one lawgiver and judge. He is Lord. Whether you accept that or not, acknowledge that or not, doesn't change the fact that he is the one lawgiver and judge, that he is God. And so only God knows the hearts and motives of people. Would you agree? It's impossible to judge other people's motives. Only God really knows. Charles Spurgeon, referred to as the Prince of Preachers back in the 1800s in London, England, he had this dynamic preaching ministry, went on for almost 40 years. It just he, you know, He's the Prince of the Preachers. And he, he and his wife, back in London, can you imagine, they, they had chickens, back in the 1800s, and they produced eggs, and they would never give any of their eggs away to their family members and people they knew. And everyone, there was gossip about that. Like, why? This guy is, you know, he's making enough money. Why isn't he, why isn't he more free with his eggs? It was only after his wife died that it came to light that for years, the money they made from selling their eggs was supporting some people in their family who needed desperately their, their help. And he didn't want the right hand to know what the left hand doing. He wanted to keep it quiet. But I'm saying, looks are deceiving. And when we start to judge on the, on the basis of appearance, we're almost always off the mark. So don't do that. Um, I don't know about you. I, I've discovered sometimes, oftentimes, I don't even know why I do what I do. Am I alone in that? I go, man, why did I do that? Or why am I feeling like I need... And if I can't figure out why I do or don't do certain things, what makes me think, who, who in the world am I to judge somebody else's motives? Only God has all the facts. Realize this. God knows every single thing about you. Every single thing. The good, the bad, the ugly. He knows how you're tr- you were treated as a baby, as a toddler, as a teenager. He knows your every disappointment. He knows every unfair thing that ever happened to you. He knows your heart. He knows why you act the way you do when no one else seems to know. That's why he's the one and only judge and lawgiver. He not only gives the law, he judges by his law. Only God is without sin. He's perfect and holy and righteous. Only God has the wisdom to both give the law and to judge by the law. So here's what we do need to understand before we move on. There is a difference. Write this down. This is a big, big point. There's a difference between judging wisely and judging, you know, being judgmental. Let me say that. The Bible speaks about, now, so you go, well, aren't we supposed to, so we're never to judge anything? No, that's not what James is saying. James is not saying, don't ever evaluate anything. That, you can't live your life that way. In fact, he, he, he actually contradicts himself a few verses later talking about evaluating things, right? You can't go through life without evaluating. So get this clear in our minds. There's a difference between evaluating something and being judgmental about something. What, let's talk about that for a minute. Jesus in Matthew 7 famously said, and most non-Christians know this. This is probably the one verse most, the world, most of the world knows. Don't judge or you will be judged. Jesus says that in Matthew 7, right? Part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, don't judge or you too will be judged. And people love to quote that verse of Jesus. But in the very next breath, verse 2, he says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. 
and the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so what Jesus is talking about when he's saying, don't judge, uh, and what James' half-brother is saying to us in this short little letter named after him here in Matthew, uh, or James 4, don't judge. He, he's talking about don't condemn people. Don't have a judgmental attitude towards people. Um, and that, that's what the context is showing. The Bible says we are to judge certain things. In fact, where, where God has spoken, when God has spoken, what he says about things, he's judging. And you're not, you're not sinning by saying, this is what God says. How am I lining up myself with that? I'm evaluating. Am I living up to it? Oh, look. And you're, you're, if you're using the same measurement that God says don't murder, let's say, am I murdering someone? I don't want to murder. Oh, we have laws, don't murder. I can't judge you. Because the Bible says don't judge. No, we, we say that's murder, don't murder. So we, that's the context. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Until, until you nod, I'm not going to go on. So, okay. <laughs> It'll hopefully get clearer. So here's what Jesus says in Matthew 7, right? He says don't judge. In verse 15, here's what he says. Watch out for false prophets. But I'm not so judge, Jesus. You said not to judge. Again, context. No, he says, be on the lookout. You got to know what a false prophet is, right? To be on the lookout. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will what? You'll know them. You're judging, right? That's, the, that's okay. That's what he's talking about doing. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? He goes on to say, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So Elizabeth Elliot, um, great lady of faith, uh, she says the current popular notion that judging others is in itself a sin leads to such inappropriate maxims as, I'm okay and you're okay. It encourages a conspiracy of moral indifference which says, if you never tell me that anything I'm doing is wrong, I'll never tell you that anything you're doing is wrong. That's not Christianity, folks. And that's not what James is talking about. That's not what Jesus is talking about. We need, I need you to come along. If I'm walking in front of a train, I don't see it. I need you to come and grab me from the train and go in front of, from standing in front of the train or the car. Go, you're, you're off. Get off of that train or you're going to get smashed. I don't think that's judging. I think that you're evaluating in a healthy way to help me. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Here in James, look at chapter 5. Skip over to James at the end of the book, the last uh, verses of, the, of James. James 5, 19 and 20. James is simply saying there's no place for self-righteous judgment, but we are called as believers to make right judgments. Here he says, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from their error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. So that's the goal. When, when you're evaluating your own life and other people's life, you're trying to get them closer to God. You're trying to bring help and healing to them versus harm to them. Let me ask you this, are you loving enough people in your life and loving them well enough that it, if you find them going off into the weeds, that you're bold enough and courageous enough to call them out in love, one-on-one, -on -one, saying, I love you, and I, I'm concerned about you. This is what I see. I might, be, I might be off. Help me understand what you're doing. Help me understand what you're thinking. But those courageous words and bold words need to be spoken to each other. That's not the kind of thing, judging that James is talking about here. We need to build those relational bridges over which we can walk and share love and concern and encouragement and even sometimes some admonishment with other people, right? That's the context of love. So are we, we are never to play judge. That's God's role, but we are to evaluate wisely. So in our remaining moments together, here's what I want us to do. I want us to look at when we find ourselves in a place where we, we're looking at something and we want to make sure we're judging fairly, we're judging righteously, we're making good evaluations, what do we need to watch for so we don't fall into being a judgmental person? Number one, hypocrisy. Okay, Write that down, hypocrisy. Romans 2.1, you therefore have no excuse, you Christians, he's talking to, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning who? Yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. And that's why Jesus said, hey, why are you so concerned about the little speck in your brother's eyes or eye when you've got a telephone protruding from your own eye? 
Deal with your own stuff first, and then you can help the other person. But make sure you're, you're in line with God. And make sure you're doing what you say you, you'll do, and you're not being a hypocrite about it. Francis Schaeffer, great Christian writer, he says, when you die, when we die and stand before God, God won't have to bring up the Ten Commandments and, and judge us by those. He said, it might be, now this, this is not in the Bible, but it's a great illustration, I think. It, it just might be that he records every judgment we've made on someone else, and then he judges us by that judgment we made on them. And that's a scary thought. And that's what his point. He says, God could just easily judge us by our own judgments we've made on other people by applying them to ourselves. And guess what? We are all lost when we do that. Because we don't even live up to the own standards that we have for ourselves. Uh, Thomas Akempis says, be not angry that you can't make others as you want them to be. By the way, do you ever get angry that you can't make other people like you want them to be? He says, since you can't make yourself as you wish to be. <laughs> All right, superficiality. Hypocrisy, superficiality. Again, be careful of, we've touched on this just briefly. Don't draw conclusions based on appearances. One study showed that we size up another person within the first 15 seconds we've met them. Are you judging me because I'm wearing shorts today? I hope not. Jesus says is this, in John 7, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. There's Jesus talking about judging again in the right way. Don't judge by outward appearances. Um, classic example of this in the Old Testament, remember they're, they're going to find a replacement king for, to, to replace Saul, and he goes, and the prophet is sent, Samuel sent to the, the home of Jesse, and uh, he says, let me see your sons, it's the son of Jesse, and all the sons pass through, five or six of them, and there's, he's not, no, there's no. They said, do you have any more sons? And what, what's the dad say? Uh, oh, yeah, we got, we got the scrawny little kid taking care of the sheep because I won't sit down until he comes. And sure enough, he shows up, and God says, that's the guy. Because ju God, it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, uh, well, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks where? At the heart. And so, how, this next one, quickly now. Um, disputable matters. Be careful of judging disputable matters. Do you have that on your outline? And the question is, okay, disputable matters. Romans 14.1. I love this passage. Accept him, talking to the church, accept the person whose faith is weak in the church. Accept each other. Everyone's at a different spot. And he goes, he goes on to say, without passing judgment. On what? Disputable matters. Isn't it? Some people find that very interesting. The Bible actually allows for things to be disputable. There's some disputable things in the church, like Jesus is Lord. He rose from the dead. Yeah. What he says goes. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Right? There's indisputable matters, though. That's what this is imply, implies, right? There are indisputable matters. And we're not to make judgments on people. Because we have room to agree to disagree on a lot of things in the church. I mean, we don't have time to get into those, but just some things. Uh, drinking. There's some churches that say, if you're a follower of Jesus, you can't drink alcohol. There's churches that say, no, you can drink alcohol. What's the Bible say? Don't get drunk with wine, right? So we've got people who abstain in our church. We've got people who drink in our church. That's a disputable matter, right? We've got smoking. You know, can you smoke and be a Christian? And I, I just tell people, you can smoke and be a Christian and, and, and go to heaven. It'll just smell, it just, it'll, it'll just smell like you've been in hell, though. But that's, <laughs> just, that's a joke. It's, just, it's a joke. No, but the, Bible doesn't, the Bible doesn't speak on it. We, we're silent about it. We have, a room, we have room for opinion, okay? That's all I'm trying to say. P school. Homeschool, public school, private school. Go to the movies. Hey, there, there are a lot of Christians who... Maybe even today, but I know growing up, people would say, no, you never can't go to the movies. Or what kind of movie you can go to. Um, and, or celebrate holidays. we got Christians who disagree on, do we celebrate this holiday or that holiday? Or even mention it, shopping on Sundays. Chick-fil-A closes up on Sundays. And, you know, can we agree and, and, and disagree? Yeah, we can agree and disagree on certain things. Okay, so 
want something to help us break the habit? Here, here's some things, a couple things as we close. How to break free from judging. Remember that we'll be judged the same way we judge others. We saw that. Jesus says it right in Matthew 7, 1 and 2. Don't judge others so that God will not judge you, for God will judge you in the same way you judge others, and he will apply to you the same rules you apply to others. Um, we're each accountable to God, Romans 14. Every one of us will then will have to then give account of himself or themselves to God, so then let us stop judging one another. And so, again, we're, we're in so much trouble when we start judging other people, as only God can really judge. Remember how much, lastly, how much God has been mer- merciful to us. This is the key, I think, in really overcoming a judgmental spirit. If we keep in mind what God has done for us, how much God has forgiven us of, how can we not be gracious towards other people? Remember how much God has been merciful to us. God has been so patient with me. One of the biggest dangers in the Christian life is forgetting how good the good news really is. (laughs) I think that's a problem in a lot of Christians' lives, a lot of churches' lives, when we forget how good the good news really is. We can start focusing on all other kinds of things. Philip Yancey says that Jesus' audience who Jesus was talking to, would have divided people into just two categories, sinners and the righteous. Yet Jesus replaces those two categories with two different categories. Sinners who admit (laughs) and sinners who deny. Sinners who admit they're sinful and sinners who deny their sinfulness. I thought, man, that's so true. The most forgiving person is the most forgiven person. So come under the mercy and, gen- and uh, uh, gr- grace of God. And so have you experienced, this is bottom line stuff. We're going to move into communion in just a moment. But here's what I want to ask you. Have you experienced the power of God's forgiveness in your life? And if you have, you're totally tracking with what I've been talking about the last 30 minutes. If you haven't yet experienced it firsthand, this, this might just be over your head. You're not going to get this. Jesus says this. Here's, here, write this down. Ask yourself this. I have, a problem. I have a problem not wanting to slander people. I have a problem not wanting to be judgmental. Ask yourself this. Maybe do I need a new father? Do I need a new family? Because just what, I close with this one. I, I know it's like the third time I said I'm closing. This, way, this is really... Uh, John 8 says this. You know this passage, many of you. Jesus says to the Pharisees of his day, you are of the father, you are of your father. Who? The devil. I mean, this is Jesus. Some people today, modern people would go, that doesn't sound very Jesus-y of Jesus. (laughs) Calling people sons of the devil. Jesus, he, he called a spade a spade. He said, look, you are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Satan is the slanderer, right? The one who kills people with his talk. Do you see how important James is, Jesus and James are talking about this? Your father, the devil, he likes to murder people. He likes to harm people. He likes to hurt people. He does not stand in the, in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. He speaks his mother tongue. For he is a liar and the father of lies. I'm telling you, if you have a problem with your tongue and you like to cut people down and slander people, You just might need a new father because you might be the father. You might have the the devil as your father this morning. But guess what? There's hope because we were all sons of the of the the evil one, right? Before we, it takes your decision to turn and say yes to Jesus and His offer, and you can do that today. In fact, we're going to have time of communion for those those of us who know Jesus. Every Sunday, we offer this opportunity for us to remember what He did for each of us on that cross. And we don't make him Lord, we acknowledge his lordship.
maybe today you need to acknowledge Jesus as the Lord that he is and that you've been rebelling all these years. That's, that's a good thing to do, folks. Just stop going away from him. Start walking towards him. And so, Father, we thank you for this powerful two verses that just rip any kind of self-judgmental or uh, judgmental self-centered spirit out of us lord and we just are humble before you because when we're humbled by your mercy when we're humbled by your grace it's a sign that we've come into the real family and so father anyone here who who needs to turn from themselves and turn to you may that step begin today may that first step be taken today and if you're here today and you're making some kind of decision, maybe some kind of movement, we would love to know about that. We'd love to come alongside you and help you on that journey. But it starts with that decision to say, I'm going to commit. I'm going to follow. I'm going to take the next step towards Jesus today. Whatever that is for you, I encourage, we encourage you to do that. So God, have your way in us, Lord. We thank you for your will and your ways in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.